when you start your career, you kind of are leveraging everything on your hard skills. It's like, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And people hire you based on like, show me what you can do, right? But as you move up the invisible ladder or whatever ladder that is for you, if you do want to get up into those like higher management positions, it's it skews way more to soft skills to the point where creative directors who've been creative directors for years and years and years, if you ask them to open a file and do something, it's kind of interesting. They, they don't really have those hard skills directly anymore. They just have right. really great taste and vision. And and, you know, they get paid for that. Yeah. So I'm so excited to catch up with you, but there's probably a, a handful of people who don't know who you are. Can you do me a favor and introduce yourselves? Uh, I'm Jen Hood of Hoodspa. This is my twin, Amy. I, I speak on behalf of, no, <laughs> Jen's the mouthpiece. <laughs> and we are sisters and co-founders of Hoodspa and we do branding identity work, type design, and to be honest, a little bit of everything. Because, you know, when you do brand identity, you kind of have the joy of if clients like working with you at the beginning, they can they keep asking you to do everything. And it's just when you want to say no, right? Yeah. And you just keep bringing people on as you need. And it's that's why branding is so fun. Yes. Okay. So I think uh, I just want to quickly point out this. This is probably a first for us. It's our first two guests on at the same time. First twins, Ooh. first design twins. And so oh. we're doing a lot of first things today. First double hit a blonde. So a lot of excitement. And <laughs> double bleach here. treatment. <laughs> Okay, you guys know we're in Get for a wild ride. Get that peroxide high going, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, normally need coffee to be caffeinated, I would say don't do that. It's going to be too much energy for you. <laughs> you can just feel the energy through your ear holes right now and take all of this in. Okay. And I'm, Chris, this is exciting yes. too, I have to say. I was so worried this morning, really quickly at the at the office, the electricity went out because they're moving all of the ab above ground, like uh, internet and electricity cables underground. And yeah. the minute they turned it on this morning, everything went dead. <laughs> And it just devolved back into, you know, like prehistoric times and we were panicking <laughs> and we were like, it's so funny how we have so many skills and we're so evolved. And then the electricity goes out and you just turn into like the worst version of yourself. <laughs> and I was just like, what are we going to do? I mean, how do I? And then I'm like trying to, I was about to email you actually, cause I was worried, but I'm so glad it went back on and we turned back into the best version of ourselves <laughs> ready for this. And I'm so excited that we got to talk to you. Just in time. Just, just the way it time. works, right? Yeah. yeah. A little sketchy moment there. Okay. You know, what's really interesting to me besides all the design stuff that you do, the lettering and all the beautiful work is that you also teach people about like pricing strategies and how to run a design business. Right. And so that's we relatively do. new, unique and different in the, in the world of creative people. How's that been going for you? It's been so fun. And it yeah. started with our book, which we talked about mm -hmm. a couple of times. Yeah. And, um, but it's been, it's so weird how like when you're a designer or a creative of some, of any kind, you always think like the greatest joy comes from the work. But then if you ever get the chance to mentor or teach that changes so quickly because it, sure that this job is fun and, and that's all great, but like being able to help someone else figure out how to like make more, get the dream clients, get the work they want, helping them the way that somebody helped us when we were young is just so rewarding. So it's been really fun. And not only that, like it's been making pretty good money too. So it's like a win-win. <laughs> I love that. You know what I feel like? I, I'm investing in the future. Yes. And that feels good. But also it's almost like as a grandparent, it's like you really need to treat your grandkids and kids right because you're about to be like phased out. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I feel like I'm training up the next generation and, and I'm building bonds and I'm hoping that when I'm on my last leg, they throw me a few bones here and there, maybe like a little design project like over here. And you know, that way when I'm like coughing out dust, I still have some income, hopefully. <laughs> Wait a minute you're not that old what are you talking about come on oh my oh now, in the life cycle of a creative i mean aren't, i mean do you know what i mean like oh i it's see it's funny. like dog years it is it is funny like people i feel yeah. like you phase out earlier because it's like there's so much good young talent you know and it's like you meet creative directors of giant companies and they're like 35 and you're like dang this is kind of crazy right um yeah. no i'm just joking though it, i'm really not <laughs> manipulating or conniving but at the same time it really does feel good like I feel like in some ways, uh, you know, there's um, benchmarks we've reached for our studio that have been so exciting. But then the benchmarks we reach, like helping other people do things that are exciting to them, it feels like that much more exciting when it's someone else. I don't know that you get to live through vicariously all over again, almost like kids, you know. <laughs> 
Well, Chris, do you find, because you have all your students, I find that having like the like younger generation, some of them are younger, some of them are just peers and we're all just kind of swapping knowledge. Right. But I just find having other people there to like tell me about new things coming down the pike or like share styles or it keeps me young. I find yes. that it keeps me young <laughs> in a way that if we were just doing our own thing, we might become myopic. Yeah. Yes. I think we get caught up in our own bubbles and we forget that there's a whole nother world and, and people have different points of view. And so being around people who are learners, what, what, regardless of what your chronological age is, sure. they're not old, crusty and jaded like some of us are. Yeah. And so they, they remind us like, oh yeah, there was a time when I used to like look forward to those things and it keeps you really honest and, and, and grounded, I think. Is that right. your experience? Oh, oh yeah. totally. Yeah, totally. totally. Or even just like, even just with live streaming our design process, like people will be in there being like, why don't you use this tool? It's way quicker. You just took 15 minutes to do what this new tool takes like two seconds to do. And I'm over here, like learning the shape builder tool, like live on air while everyone just like reams me. <laughs> but it's like, it's this great humbling process of like, you know, technology is always changing. So if you're just doing things the way you've always done them, you know, there's, there's all these new ideas, new ways of doing things. So yeah, any kind of like sharing your process, I always find I learn just as much, if not more, from sharing what I think I know, um, because you have to quantify it and you have to kind of like organize it all together. And it really does help you kind of solidify the why. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we've done uh, several pieces of content together, but I'm always a little surprised when people actually never watch the YouTube channel and they only listen to the podcast. So for those people, if, if you don't mind, I just want to do a little quick origin story of you two so that at least they know who the voices are and where it comes from. You're not native Californians. You're from Kentucky originally. Is that right? We were born in California, but we did do our oh. formative years in Kentucky. So you are 100% right. And our, our grandma and our mom's family all lives there. So you have all the people. So are heavy ties in Kentucky. Yes. I see. Okay. So when, when is it that you discover design and who discovered it first? Gosh, well, it, I think we discovered art really early because we love to draw and doodle. And our okay. mom had that book. Um, let's see, it's something about like help your kids make a million dollar lemonade stand. I don't know. Maybe somebody knows <laughs> an actual title that's somewhat similar to that. But the idea being, I think our mom always had this great idea that like she would raise entrepreneurs, which is great because from an early age, she was always telling us like, oh, let's write a book together. And we would doodle like book ideas together. And like we wanted to draw murals on our wall and she made us like sketch something out so that she, like we could we prove our prove concept. It to her, the art director. She was like Shark Tank. We had to like, you know, <laughs> propose it to the board and she would pass it. And then we would get to draw on our walls. So she gave us a lot of freedom, but also like instilled this crazy amount of like just blind belief that we could, you know, do stuff and make stuff and just like kind of do it. So we would draw it a lot, draw it a lot. We draw it a lot. And, um, but then later on, I think the easiest Pretty soon we started making it lucrative. Like in high school, I would, I would make a Valentine's shirt for my boyfriend, you know, like bedazzle a shirt that says I love Ross or whatever. And then the other girls would be like, Oh, I like that. And so I would charge all the girls to make shirts for their boyfriends, you know? So it's like pretty soon you start to realize that this is a skill that you can trade. And then somebody tells you in college, like, Oh, this is actually a job that you can have. Like you, you don't have to do like art can pay the bills. And I think Jen, it was your like aptitude test that told you that. Yeah. Right? I just took like a quiz in the, the, the community college career center. It's like, please help me make money with my drawing. And the computer said design. And I said, I think I'm already doing that for my friend's band, you know, like, which everyone does. I think when you're young and you like to draw, you like doodle stuff, scan it in and then make printer print it out at Kinko's. And you don't even know that you put comic sans with a doodle and that's graphic design, you know? So yeah, it was kind of more organic like that. Okay. So if I get this right, then your, your mom has encouraged and fostered a creative and entrepreneurial spirit. So the seeds were planted early. Oh yeah. Now I, I just want to quickly dip back in there. Uh, who is your mom? Like, why does she think this is right for her children? To be honest, it's not, it's the Jost family line. It's, okay. and it's the hood. Also my dad too. They have always been very, just like hard workers, like never expect anything to be given to you. You have to work and claw for it claw. and then, and then say thank you. <laughs> um, so I think it was just like a mixture of our dad is like the hardest, such a hard worker and all of his family really prides himself on that. And then our mom's whole family have always run their own ranch, run their own farm, run their own business, very grassroots business. Yeah. And, and they've always had two or three businesses. They ran the country store. They rent, they rented out their fields to tr for, tr you know, farming. And then they also did backhoe service. So it's like always three hands and three different pies. 
And but she my grandma is such a baller. So she's also kind of the one who passed down this entrepreneurial spirit. And she would pay for a Cadillac every year in cash. It was a used Cadillac, but it was only a year old. And, and you know how she did it. She never gave any money away because <laughs> she used to she used to make us, you know, do all the chores around the house, which, yeah, you should. Your kids and you have to pull your weight. Right. But um, and it's funny because we would like work all day in the yard and she would give us a quarter, you know, so it's like she was just really. And that's what she taught us. It's like save, save, save. Like, yeah. you know, a dollar saved is way worth more than a dollar earned. If you can like not live above your means, then you're doing really well, which I didn't think was that novel of a concept until I moved to California <laughs> where you realize that many Shots people fired. don't understand this <laughs> <Shots laughs> basic, basic principle of saving your money and, and at least, you know, budgeting and stuff. So I am really grateful that, um, you know, just basic financial skills, which nowadays I think there's a lot more of that being introduced early on in, in you know, middle school, high school, where you have to, they have all these apps and programs to try and teach financial literacy, which is so great because the I earlier- I don't even think they do it enough though. Like I wish they did it more. I wish it was more built into the curriculum. Yeah. Like our friend yeah. Sen Funches, he's like got a whole, you know, startup that's angled at teaching kids financial literacy, but mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we, we understand the hard work stuff runs deep and in, in, in the veins there. So we get that and you, and you have to earn your way through life. Nothing's going to be handed to you. I get all that part. Where does the art and drawing and using creativity come in prior to you doing that aptitude test on a computer? Okay. We moved around a lot. So California to Wisconsin, Wisconsin to New York, New York to Kentucky, Kentucky back to California. <laughs> all at pivotal moments. We're all before 16. <laughs> all, all amidst a stream of braces and acne. So, <laughs> so, this is what I'm t- So we realized pretty quickly, oh my gosh, this is a skill people find interesting for some reason because we would draw. And it's then- like how Lemmy from Motorhead is the most hideous man alive, but put a guitar in his hand, get him up on the whiskey stage. Like this man can get any lady he wants. It's this kind of thing. If you're an artist, you can make friends despite being kind of like, you know, zitty and awkward. You know? it, it, that sounds sleazy, but I really, I mean, it, it really was a way to just connect with people. And I think we realized, oh, okay, people find creativity interesting. And like, we can collaborate with people because they, you know, have a band, they want to make this poster or, you know, they like comics, I like comics, whatever. And so I think it, it kind of was a way to just make a connection. Um, and so, and it was just fun. And we, you know, it's just something we did naturally. So we kind of transitioned that to, well, and thank goodness we came up during the time when John Contana was blazing away for hand-drawn <laughs> yes. logos, because do you remember 20, 2000? Yeah. Do you remember when this happened, Chris? How did you feel? How did Art Center take it? <laughs> <laughs> I know everyone from Art Center is trying to use Helvetica and, yeah. you know, me and Amy are like doodling hand-drawn lettering and scanning it in poor and like poorly vectorizing it and calling it a logo. But, um, that was early days of our, our like logo, uh, treatment, but eventually we, we kind of did like clean it up and learn how to do it properly. <laughs> Luckily. Okay. I find this a little bit hard to believe because the way that you, uh, since I've known you, you're both very outgoing. You seem super fun and gregarious, but even if you moved around a lot, I just don't feel like you guys would have a hard time blending in. First of all, you always have your friend or best friend with you everywhere you go. So you're never really that lonely. So I feel like it's always like you come into a new school and you just dominate. So <laughs> we, is we that wrong? It. Okay. It's wrong. <laughs> well, tell me, tell me. I will then, say that's hard mom- to believe. I I will say our mom made it instilled in us, like try to be friends with everybody, you know, like, and, and people are just as scared as you. So if you just are the first one to go up and talk to them, that's usually all it takes is somebody to go up and say, Hey, I'm Amy, you know? So we've always been pretty good at meeting people, except when we moved to California back in six, when we were 16, people in California, man, they like to withhold that love. Like they just (laughs) very withholding, (laughs) especially in high school. I think everyone was just so scared of being rejected that I, I just remember like, I would see somebody from first period, like in the hall and I'd be like, Hey, and start waving. And they were just like, Oh my gosh. And they would just keep walking. <laughs> I was like, this is it. We're not in Kentucky anymore. We're not in Kentucky anymore. <laughs> well, cause in Kentucky, everyone waves, you wave at complete strangers. Yes. You, it's a big wave. State. It's a big wave state. Yeah. You got to tip the hat. Otherwise you're a rude, rude outsider, you know, but Chris, don't you find like, even if you're outgoing now, like you say that you're a loud introvert, like yes. you kind of learn how to read the room or how to read certain situations and kind of how to get out of your comfort zone. And when we were young, we were really good at it in high school. They beat us down in California. They beat down our spirit, (laughs) but we learned again later, just that, like, just kind of remembering that, like everybody's scared 
if you're just the first person to say hi or put yourself out there, people usually want to connect. Wouldn't yeah. you say that's true? I don't know. I had to think about this, but I also want to quickly interject that this is an interview with Amy and Jen Hood from Hood Spa. It's not an anti-California propaganda <laughs> piece. <laughs> we love to be honest. <laughs> this is probably refreshing because most people just hear us go on and on about how much we love it here. <laughs> right. Okay. So this is a departure then, right? Yes. I mean, we're here for a reason. We're paying all this money for <laughs> a reason, right? I will never, you'll have to drag my carcass from this state. I love it so much here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this idea that, that people want to connect, maybe because I've grown up in California most of my life, that there is sometimes, and especially in LA, there are standoffish like, who the hell are you? And why should I even give you two looks? Right. Sure. Because, uh, here everybody is famous. Everybody's beautiful. Everybody yeah. is talented. And who, who the heck are you and what can you do for me? So there is a little bit of that stereotype that I think rings true in some experiences. So you guys faced it at 16 and, but I still am like, you ladies can't, I, I don't know how I could process this, like that you had a hard time so that you use art to like uh, be your, your I, uh, I wish offering. we could call a friend. Remember in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? We got to call a friend. <laughs> I wish I could have called some of my friends or, who could have been like, yeah, these girls, you wouldn't believe how quiet. I literally would just go like sit behind the gymnasium just so nobody would like notice but me. You know I was how, so, <laughs> I love listening to Conan O'Brien's podcast because you know, he interviews a lot of comedians and stuff. But it's funny how even like comedians are generally when they're not, doing comedy, kind of quiet and, you know, observant. And I think that we really do like to observe the world and like gather information and then be like, oh, okay, so that's going on. Like we kind of like assess the situation and then we try and like make a connection the way we, you know, any way we can to try and like, you know, reach out to people. Cause we, we really do, we are social people. I think even yeah. though like it's not always easy at the get go, but, um, I think that's also why, you know, if, after that, we've really been interested in creating community because having moved around a lot, we realized how hard it can be, oh, it can be so to hard. get new community. And so later on in our life, it was always like, let's like start a meetup in Orange County because everyone thinks oh, it's only fun in LA. Like, let's see if we can make something fun in Orange County, you know? So we started a little meetup with some friends and everyone else was craving that same community. And then, you know, with the workshops and stuff like that, I think we're always just interested in like, let's try and like bring some people together around this. Yeah. Surely we're not the only ones who think this is interesting or we should, you know, like put our heads Share together Share this, this knowledge yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So for all the art nerds out there who may not have a twin sister, not be bursting at the seams with energy and waving at everybody, uh, <laughs> I think it's really neat that you were like, okay, um, what is it that I can do that gives me some acceptance and some cachet? Because especially in that whole social hierarchy, that seems to help. Like if I do one thing that's unique and people like, I can build an identity around that, right? Mm -hmm. Going back to my original question, I had asked you like who got into design first. So is that Jen? It was, it was Jen. Jen definitely took the first graphic design class because we were like five years into this two-year community college. I mean, we were like <laughs> very much overstaying our welcome, but our, but our dad was like, I just love that my dad, as soon as like we needed a car, he's like, all right, go get a job. And then it came time for college. I'm like, all right, dad, are you paying for me to go to UCLA or what? And he's like, no. <laughs> um, but I, I honestly thank him for that because we had to work to pay for our school. We had to work to yeah. pay for our rent, all those things. So it took us longer to do a community college, but because I waited, I made a friend at my coffee shop job and he owned a magazine. Him and his friends had started this local magazine. Okay. Now he had definitely talked it up. It was a coupon clipper. Um, but he gave me my first job and he actually taught Jen and I on the job. He gave us an apprenticeship. So we basically got to learn design for free on the job and get paid to do it. So it was like, it, I couldn't that's what asked. you call a good R ROI. You know I, what I mean? I couldn't have asked for a better first job. <laughs> and he gave us so much responsibility because it was just us three and him churning out like three publications and a bunch of print house, you know, like business cards for small businesses and recreating logos for people who only had like a 300 pixel JPEG of their logo. <laughs> okay. So I, I want to get the chronology here. You come back to California 16, you deal with the snobby people and you're in community college, it's taking a little longer to process this. And then you're working. So you're like, are you in your twenties now? Yeah. Twenties. Yeah. 18, 19, yeah. 20, 21. Okay, yeah. So right on there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, okay, we, we must've so, got our first job when we were like 20 doing design. Cause we started hoods, but when we were like 25, so. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. All right. So you get this job and then 
is it a two for one? Like you hire one sister and you get the other yeah, one? It was crazy. <laughs> like people always ask yeah. like, cause we always thought we'd do our own thing. We never had glasses together. Yeah. We kind of had our own friends, even though we would bring them together on the weekends, but like we pretty much had our own lives. Now we are, we are absolutely like merged at the hip in every mm-hmm. possible way. <laughs> and it I can all verify started that because, that is true. <laughs> yes. And it all started because this guy who came into my coffee shop was like, I need two designers. And I was like, I right. happen to know somebody who I know works as hard as I do. You know, you know yeah. what the funny thing is too? I was working at California pizza kitchen, which they make some good pizza. If anyone <laughs> out there believes it's true. Um, and I was a server and I was making pretty good money with the tips, you know? So I was like, <laughs> I'm like, we're going, we're taking a step back here with this magazine job. Jen, her, her view of, the, of like her future was so small at that time. She just so thought I can make a hundred dollars worth of tips. Like why it was so I? small. Yeah. But then I saw, I don't know if any of you have been a server at any point. Most people have, but it's like when you see the life long term of a server, it's just like uh, working nights and weekends, you never see your friends. And then you just get like drunk after work to like numb the pain of like serving people all day, you know? So I was like, I can't keep doing this. This is really bad for my psyche. You know, I just, this can't be a long-term solution. So, um, so yeah, we both worked at the print house. So we worked at the print house. Yeah. And Slash magazine. We got so much great experience by just doing really quick, quick iteration, rapid yeah. fire ad work. Like there just wasn't time. It was like a 30 day turnaround to make two magazines. And we had to do like 50 ads each for clients. And at one point we had three magazines, like they would just keep piling on the magazines, but never hire anyone else. So it was just like, Oh, it was crazy. But it was great work because, I mean, you do, you just learn so much by just repetition, right? The 10,000 hours. So, um, but then when we started Hoodsbow, we realized we needed to learn again, but with repetition of a different sort. Like we had to elevate the kind of work we were doing. Like you can't, like we didn't want to do ads anymore, obviously, like no more coupon ads for local, uh, you know, carpet cleaning companies. So um, we had to do all the things that you, you tell everyone to do, you know, like make your passion projects, like make stuff you want to you know, get paid for. So there was a lot of, so we were kind of like juggling. Um, like I had a part-time job doing more ads for another magazine. And then Amy was like kind of full-time trying to build up Hudspa, and we were, you know, kind of living off of some savings and trying to bankroll the dream, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So is that the extent of your design education? Isn't that shocking? We took two it, college it, design you took, classes. I took one. <laughs> Amy took one and then we learned on the job and a lot of but things. But it was basically we, three years of on the job training, I would yeah. say. And you know what? We learned all the really good things of soft skills. I'll say we did learn the programs and um, the, he did teach us really well, but we did also pick up some bad habits. But that's, I mean, you know, you kind of realize as you go through life, oh, okay, I need to relearn that because that, yeah. that wasn't proper or whatever. Or, you know, I, more of the technical stuff, I think we did have to relearn a lot to kind of pivot to what we wanted to do. But that the soft skills we learned were invaluable with dealing with so many clients on such a short deadline all the time. Just learning to like focus their attention, learning all the different communication styles that people have and how like if you really do want to get the most out of people, you can't be so rigid as to not be flexible to how they have to be communicated with. Like we're millennials, so we're terrified of the phone, but we had to get on the phone and like bother these, you know, boomers (laughs) about their ad, their ad deadlines. (laughs) So so it's like, you got to sometimes get out of your (laughs) comfort zone. Yeah, totally push this out of our comfort zone. Yeah. And get used to like talking confidently on the phone and like leading people and making them feel comfortable to say it's approved, you know? Yes. So when you talk about soft skills, in case people are like, what the heck are they talking about? It's things like thinking, negotiation, communication, right? And then the hard skills are, I know how to use Adobe Illustrator, InDesign or whatever. And you got a little bit of both while doing a gazillion ads. Right. Exactly. And it's interesting because like when you start your career, you kind of are leveraging everything on your hard skills. It's like, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. And people hire you based on like, show me what you can do. Right. But Mm -hmm. as you move up the invisible ladder or whatever ladder that is for you, if you do want to get up into those like higher management positions, it's, it skews way more to soft skills to the point where creative directors who've been creative directors for years and years and years, if you ask them to open a file and do something, it's kind of interesting. They, they don't really have those hard skills directly anymore. They just have right. really great taste and vision and you know they get paid for that. So it is kind of interesting, but we never got to that full point where we fully delegated, even with Hoodspo. We love doing the hands-on work too. And that's why we've purposefully stayed small because we want to do the work ourselves. We don't want to just pass it off to someone. We're kind of greedy that way, you know? Mm. Mm-hmm. It's probably that um, farming hard labor work ethic that was instilled <laughs> in you that you're like, you know, this is an honest day's work, right? 
It, it is. does. It feels yeah. good to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I find a lot of reward from being able to see, <laughs> see something at the end of the day. Yeah. This is where you and I may depart from like our philosophy on business, right? Right. Because I think uh, that it, as an entrepreneur, at some point, if you, if you want to grow beyond like a boutique creative service agency that you actually have to hire people and you have to delegate and then you have oh, you to make do. hard decisions. And, oh, you have to, you, know. you do. And which is why we stayed small. We realized yeah. when we started trying to grow, we were just like, this isn't for us. Let's just use our name and we'll just get bigger projects and bigger pay as people see that we are better and better at what we do. Right. But th- that's the cool thing. Like Chris, what you built will live long, long after you are right. gone because you have scaled that to a team. That's not just you anymore. I mean, you are that amazing figurehead, but you've trained up all these amazing people who can, you know, carry it going. Torch, yeah. So that's, what's so cool is like, you'll have a legacy. We'll just be that flash in the pan, but like it was known. It was super known. hot though. <laughs> yeah, super it, hot it flash burned, in the pan. Right. It burned yeah, it bright did. and hard, but it faded out because we didn't, <laughs> we didn't set it up for a long time, but that's okay with it. Like, to be honest, like we're like, you know what? I think we're more like almost expert, uh, they're hiring an expert to do it. They're not really hiring an agency. We've just kind of elevated, but there, I think there's something really cool to that. I don't, when we first started Hutzpo, we did have the vision of like, Oh, we want to be the pentagram. Like we want to grow to be that thing. And then we were like, actually we can kind of still do these things that we like to do ourselves. We could just be a small brand that's really well known and is an expert in that, in that wheelhouse, you know? And um, for anyone out there who doesn't feel like they're really that's not their wheelhouse to scale, scale, scale. Like you really can still get your dream jobs if you at least position your small brand the right way as an expert, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of paths towards being uh, or making a living, being a creative person. What you guys are doing, you can also work for someone. That's okay too. Oh, totally. Yeah. Me and yeah, just delegate most of the work. Well, there's a lot of people working for someone else making way more than we are. (laughs) (laughs) Probably way happier. They sleep more. But it's interesting. It's like each person does the path that like, yeah, they find the most interesting. But this is what I want to know, Chris. I'm going to turn it back on you because you recently had your face in Times Square, which is so cool. And it was from a NASDAQ company that went public, right? But it's like your face was in Times Square. And unless you're in a Calvin Klein ad or, you know, you're a Marvel Universe character being promoted for the next movie, like you don't get your face in Times Square, you know? What what an achievement. I need to know details. Okay. It's not as big of an achievement as you might think. (laughs) So well, it was there and I saw the photo. And thanks for called. like drawing me into this. And now everybody's going to like, oh, it was just that. That's it. Okay. I'll tell you the whole story. Okay. Spilled it's me. a very quick story. Um, first of all, it only appeared on that screen for a, a moment. It was very up and then it was gone. And it only looks like it's something because we were given a photograph of it. So it's like, wow, this is awesome. Yeah. But here's the thing. One of my design internet friends, Chris Green, he said, Chris, there's this company and they're going to feature people. You should submit your photo. I'm like, oh God, do I really want to do this? And then I looked at it. Only five people made a comment. So part of the contest was you have to make a comment. I'm like, my odds of one of five, pretty good. <laughs> Very high. And they didn't require anything else. They didn't say anything like you have to like jump through three hoops and and, and, you know, uh, wrestle bear or anything. It was really straightforward. Submit your image. Uh, tell us a little something about what you do. And that was it. I didn't think anything else of it. Um, and then Monday morning, they're like, you need to be sure you're there for the opening bell tomorrow at nine or AM or Eastern standard time. I'm like, well, that's not a lot of time for me to get on a plane. So I had to reach out to my friends on the internet and that's, that's all it was. It was. I love kind of- that. Is that not like the most amazing parable though, to just like put yourself out there because no matter, yeah. and Chris, you have like, you are one of the most famous designers out there and you still said, yeah, I'm going to do this little contest on Instagram. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know no. what I'm saying? Like, like if there's I one think, of 2000 people. I'm like, shoot, you know, right. I mean, no, but I think that's great. But you played the odds. Yeah. That's smart. Also, Chris, yeah, you the have, odds were really good. And your nighttime skin regimen. You've been prepping for this. You've been prepping for this, baby. Yeah, I want all my life. Was meant to be big. Moment. I want to know what K Beauty regimen you're on. <laughs> yeah, you do not age. Okay. All right. I want to get it back to you guys, though. <laughs> the, the thing that you said, which I think a lot of people are going to have a hard time figuring out on their own, because your story isn't the typical story. Uh, self taught, took two classes in a community college, and, and gets a job at a coffee shop design. And then all of a sudden, three years later, I'm going to start a company. So if somebody is out there sitting there thinking, I'm doing those coupons or those ads still, help me, please. What do you say to those people? 
It's interesting because it's so much easier to start when you're young and you have blind ambition. So I really try not to tap down any any ambition that someone's has when they're young, even if it may be too soon for them to start their own business, because ideally you would get two to three years working for somebody else so that you can see like how things work, what to do and what not to do right on someone else's dollar (laughs) and with steady income, because you want to have that savings net for when you do go out on your own. But at the same time, nothing will force you or uh, what would you say, persuade you more than not having any other fallback than to just do the outreach and get clients because you have to pay your bills. Right. So it's interesting which was as much, experience. which was our experience. We, the magazine we were at folded, we were basically just out on our butts and we live in Orange County and it's very expensive here. So we started our company much sooner than we had anticipated because on paper, we were not hireable for the reasons that we have said. One design class uh, worked at a coupon clipper. I wish I could show you my portfolio. It's so funny. Um, But these ads worked for the clients and that's really all that mattered. But as far as getting hired on it, no, it wasn't going to happen. So we really just had to start the company just because we knew we had all these friends that had been asking us for months and months and months to do these little projects for them. Them, but we hadn't had time because of our full-time job. So we basically just reached out to everybody. But when somebody is at a steady job and they're like, I want to go out on my own, you know, and maybe they're a little bit young, I always just try to tell them like, start getting a roster of clients on the side first, start building up your nest income, try to get three months savings at least so that you have operating expenses to bankroll the slow months as you get rolling, <laughs> you know? Um, but at the same time, I, I love when young people want to start something because you never have the freedom like you do when you're young and you don't have maybe a wife or kids or a lot of overhead from a house, you know? So it's like, why not try something when you'll bounce back and your bones are made of rubber, you know? Like, why not try something big. Who knows? And I I actually feel for people who they do have the steady income, they have reached that really great job that they love, but they still have that dream of going out on their own. It's harder for them because it's, <laughs> they have such a great thing going, right? You work for someone else, you, you know, and now their monthly nut is probably so high. Exactly. So for them, you just have to kind of think about it more of like, will I hate myself if I never try this? Right. So it's like build up your, again, build up savings, 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 because at that point in your life, obviously you probably have a little bit more to lose. Maybe there's people who rely on you. So you've just really got to build up savings. And then even still, like if you can muster up the energy to start it on the side, even though that's a lot to ask of someone, um, especially if, you know, maybe you're older and you're just like, not as energetic as you once were, but still starting anything on the side is the easiest way, just low risk and high reward. Just see if you can prove the model with two or three clients, if you actually even enjoy doing it. And then from there, you can kind of see like, am I willing to try and scale this up? You know, in a situation like that, you're, you're working at the magazine and the magazine folds. And so now you're like, what do we need to do? Right. We need to do something. And I look at gaps like Sometimes there's a confidence gap. Sometimes there's a skill gap and sometimes there's an opportunity or a network gap. It seemed to me like you're not short of confidence. Uh, Your network of friends that you said had been bothering you about doing something. So you had opportunities and you use those three years wisely to close whatever skill gap. But I kind of have to think if you showed your portfolio at that time, it'd just be a bunch of ads and ads generally are not that sexy. Did you feel at that point in time that you had the the skills, you just didn't have the proof of that in the work that you were doing? 100%. 100%. Okay. We always knew. I always was like, I'm going to be a famous artist or I'm going to own my own <laughs> big business. Like, I, did, I just I did knew it. <laughs> I never felt the same way, but I thought, well, at least I can cling on to Amy while she rides high into the sky. <laughs> I don't know why. When I was in Kentucky, I was like, I'm, I'm made for big things, baby. I was so... I was so out there. I had so much confidence. It's outrageous. I would dress like Gwen Stefani or like Britney Spears. I was just like so out there. But um, but yeah, so I think I always like really wanted to do that. I just knew that like, like you said, the skills, maybe I hadn't had the opportunity. And also I just hadn't learned the the programs to do like the more fun work, the more like creative work. I had mostly just been a kind of a yes man for clients to get their ad done. So, so yeah, that first year was just taking on projects, really any project we could, we were not at all picky at first. Um, and but you, then on the side we were doing passion work. So yes. we made a lot of, you know, just stuff that we thought was cool to try and try see. and build a style. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Work that you did just for you. Yeah, exactly. Right. I love and that. all okay. of my favorite mm-hmm. designers still do that, even if they work for someone else, even if they work for themselves. People like Matt Stevens. I mean, he did like 
um, good movies as old books. It's a big project. And I think it was like he did like something like 150 entries and he ended up making it into a coffee table book that sold out. It was so popular. And it just started as an exercise of like, what are what are what's the pop culture that I love and how's how's a way that I can test and flex my illustration skills and make this something for me. And almost always when you make something for you to to practice a skill and you do more than 10 people, people grab onto that. People like that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I think those daily or weekly exercises that you give yourself a prompt. So you don't have to really think about the assignment and that there's a lot of constraints that you work within. Those are great portfolio building exercises that can lead to a lot of different things like great marketing materials to get clients or potentially turn into a product that pays for itself. I, I like that. Um, one, one thing I want to quickly highlight is that whether or not you had it, Jen, Amy had it, right? So she had this belief that she was going to be a world famous designer and everybody's going to celebrate that. So then she just needed to manifest that into reality. And so I think that's something for people to understand. We're, we're giggling about it. We're laughing about it. Cause like, who is she to think, you know, she's so superior to everybody else. Right. But you need a little bit of that. You really do. So each and every single person who's listening to this, think about this future state where you, you've you achieved not all of your goals, but some of your goals. And then once you magnetize yourself to that goal, the means and the methods will appear. Right. And I think that's you, you are living proof of that. Oh, yeah, it's so true. Well, I met this lady one time. She was saying um, the important thing is not figuring out how you're going to do it, which that sounds really like naive, but hear me out. She said the <laughs> yeah. important thing is not figuring out how to do it. It's just figuring out what you want to do and starting to talk about it with as many people as you can, because the people around you will actually be those connectors that help you get to the next steps. And now, of course, yeah, logically try and think and through like how the best way you would do it is, but don't close your off yourself off to just talking it out with people because they'll say, oh my gosh, I know someone who right. wants something like that. And they will actually make better connections for you than you could ever just dream up out of nowhere, right? Because it's the real world and you just can't plan ahead for the perfect scenario. So yes, plan, because I mean, planning is smart, but then also just just talk about it. And it just goes to show like, you know, Amy was way more confident probably than I was. If I was probably left to my own devices, I would probably just go to work for someone else like my whole life, even though I do like doing my own thing. So, but it, it speaks to how important it is to have community around you, you know, and just to like hold yourself accountable by telling people what you want to do and then letting them actually kind of like ride you on it. <laughs> like being like, what are, where is that at? Like, why haven't you finished that? Like, you know, like having people who can kind of call you on your stuff so that you can like push yourself to the next level. If that's what you want, not, not everybody wants to be constantly like harassed and ranked, but I actually right. kind of like having friends who really like, you know, talk honestly with me about things that I've, I've said I want to do. Yeah. I, I think it's so neat and special that you have a, a friend, a sister and a business partner and someone who has very complimentary personality traits where she, as far as I know, comes across as the rebel, the risk taker, the, you know, I don't care if it works out because I'll make it work. And then you're like the pragmatic, let's, let's get this thing done. And so she can jump first and you're like, how's the parachute? You know, <laughs> Did parachute, it what parachute? <laughs> right? <laughs> I didn't and know what I needed the parachute. <laughs> right? And then you're like, oh, she didn't die. I'll jump too now. Right. Uh, but it's a combination of those two things. And it's very rare and special that you have that, uh, especially because you're sisters and it, it works out really well. Okay. I want to circle back to something that you kind of just said very jokingly. Your your grandmother had money because she never spent any of it. She never gave it to anybody. And I'm thinking work at a coffee shop designed for magazine living in <laughs> California. Like the math doesn't add up. Oh, it's man. freaking we were expensive with, to live here. We were living with eight people at one point. Oh, yeah. We were living so, in a big okay, now, house. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Don't, don't skip any of the details and tell us <laughs> oh, the sorry. dark period there. Yeah. Tell us all. Oh, <laughs> my God. It was such a dark period. And when I, when that guy offered me that job, I was working at this coffee shop and people were honestly worried about me. I was like cursing like a sailor. Any little thing would like fly me off the handle. Like I just, I had not achieved these dreams of being a famous artist and I thought it was going to be fine art. So I, I think I was like really spiraling as to like, I had all these goals. Why? I thought I was so good. Why is no one seeing the potential in me? Like they're not seeing me the way I see me. And, um, and it was so good though. I, I find that we've thrived under rejection. And I, I read this article by Brian Collins and he was, it was like a letter to design students or something like that. And this student basically asked him like, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel like there's a place for me. I don't feel like 
there's anybody who really wants what I have. And he said, most of the greats don't. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a great, he's just, he was just saying like, if you're carving a new path where people don't really share the same tastes as you in this area or in this field, that means you need to start your own little community. You need to start your own little thing, you know, start, um, invite people into what you're doing, start yeah. inviting people into what you're doing rather and, than trying to fit into what they're doing. Sure. Yeah. So right. I think pretty quickly I was like, okay, I'm probably not going to go to design school. I don't have the money. They don't want they don't want my portfolio, <laughs> um, you know? And so I just started taking opportunities and then maximizing them. So at that coupon clipper, I started my own interview column and I, we had great readership because it was a free magazine that had a few local interest stories and then mostly just ads. Well, I would convince the editor to give me an, a interview column where I would interview local celebrities and I would just tell them what the readership was. I never showed them the magazine. I would just call their PR people and say like, we go to a hundred thousand homes, like great readership. We'd like to interview Buzz Aldrin. And they would say, sure. (laughs) (laughs) And so we interviewed people like Merle Haggard and all these really cool people. And, and I can only imagine their face when they actually got the, the printed magazine, like just shock and horror. But it, you know, we, we just leveraged the opportunities we had to be the best they could and to kind of get us to that next level. Well, and then when we started Hood Spice Bars, we were, we were, we were renting a, a place with uh, five, there was like five of us total. And then we had the kind of living room sectioned off as Hood Spice HQ. And we just made it look so cool and then <laughs> took photos at the right angles to make it look like a studio, you know? And so that was the office. And that was what we used on the website to make it look like this was a above board <laughs> operation, you know? And then there was just a lot of trade with friends for photography and stuff like that. I like that. Oh my gosh. Because yeah, I, I, I suspected this was true and, and, and you're proving it to be true. Uh, the name chutzpah is really what you embody. The fact that you had the uh, intestinal fortitude to just call up <laughs> famous people. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just by hook or by crook, get stuff done. Cause I got places to be and things to do. And you didn't let <laughs> the reality of it <laughs> uh, temper your your vision of what the future is like, like for you, you're like, I'm, you know, I'm the ed- creative director, editor of Vogue. I'm going to call people. <laughs> yeah, that that exactly. was kind of like how you felt, even though it was like the penny saver or something. You just totally. You, right. And I Holy think God. it's also th- being instilled with that thing. Like our dad would, I don't, he never said it, but it's like, if you're going to do a job, do it right. So even though we were working at a job where I'm pretty sure I was making $12 an hour, like I, we were making literally nickels and dimes. And, um, but I still treated it like I would work overtime. They didn't even pay us overtime. I would just work nonstop because I wanted this to be like sunset magazine, you know? And obviously there's some bad habits there. Like I think we're always more eager to just like We have to prove ourselves as a bit of a chip on the shoulder, but we had to relearn some things like healthy boundaries and, you know, um, actually kind of like finally getting used to asking for what we're worth and not apologizing all the time. Like, obviously that was a different hurdle we had to pass when we started chutzpah, which was not just being like, um, it's going to be this price, but I'm sorry. I don't know. Whatever you want to pay. Like you can't do it like that. So we did have to really learn to show confidence in a different way. Um, not just in seals, but just in talking money, which was not something we were very comfortable with at all. So, um, getting confident there, like we had some friends who, um, had really good business experience. And so, uh, we would just kind of like run scenarios with them and they were kind enough to just be like, just say this, this, and this. And, uh, we just took as much advice as we could from literally anywhere we could get it. Shout out to Mark Hemi and Joel Buchelman, pretty much everyone who's ever given us advice ever in our life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So you're making nickels and pennies. <laughs> okay. And you're working like dogs for three years. They're just piling on the work and you don't spend any of, any of it. I assume because you you have to live pretty modestly here. It's not a lot of money. At, at one point do you, you say to each other, like, I, I think this is a thing. Well, let's get our own place. And I think we can, we're going to have clients and things are going to work. When was that? How old are you? And what happened to trigger that? Gosh, I wish I could remember the moment. I feel like it's so easy to just like, as, as you start to accomplish things, it's easy to forget those like really early, just big, meaningful wins. But I think year three was when we started finally feeling like we had our footing. We finally got hooked in with some local agencies that had got us like those logos that you want on your logo carousel, right? Like history channel, Tribeca film festival. And it's amazing how just putting those, the work doesn't even have to be good. You put those logos on your logo carousel on your website and people just assume, you know what you're doing. It's like the power of putting the Nike symbol on literally any design. It immediately becomes cool in the eye of the beholder. And so just having to being able to say, we worked with agencies like these 
73 and sun, sunny, 73, 72 and sunny. And, um, you know, just being able to put those logos on the carousel was a huge game changer for us. And that's when we knew, I think like, okay, if we're doing it right for these agencies, we no longer have to worry, like, is our process what other people are doing? I think everybody worries that is, is everyone doing it this way? Is this how it goes? So only three years in, into your nascent business, you're working with international brands. Yeah, which to be honest, felt like forever <laughs> at the time. The, the, uh, the girl, the head on this girl. It's like, it's like I, know, three years. I know, but because some yeah. people start their businesses and sure they have more years experience like before starting their own business and they just grow yeah. so quickly. And I feel like that's what I always see is like one year in, they're already working with Facebook or whoever, you know, like yeah. whatever multi-million dollar company. But yeah, wow. we were working with those clients via subcontract from an agency. Sure. So, but in, in right. some ways we're like, okay, this is fine. Literally we'll take it any way we can get it. But it, I think it also helped us realize, oh, okay, so we really don't need the middleman. Like we can get these. We just have to build up our, our confidence in our pr- presentation because those clients do expect a different level of, you know, um, song and dance. Well, yeah. And leadership through the project. Like yeah. they just want to know, like, you're not going to just disappear tomorrow. You're not just like a flight or fancy freelancer, but someone that they can rely on like they would rely on a large agency. So you just have to, you really have to run your P's and Q's and really give the right presentation from the get go. The decks have to be right. The calls have to be right. The way you talk to them, it just has to be a different level of, of just, um, assurance to them, you know, and rightly so, you know, they've got a lot more on the line when they're the, those larger, uh, companies, you know? The question I always get from people is like, when you start working with big brands, it's easy to work with big brands. The The problem yeah. is, how do you get to work with the big brands? So you're working with friends, uh, probably mom and pop businesses. How is it that you're able to get one of those big brands? Okay. It's always, I find Jen and I did this really fun exercise where we tried to circle back to our biggest clients and how we got them. Was it, so for Red Bull, we got that through a DM on Instagram like they just, we were posting work nonstop, really trying to get ourselves into the surf moto kind of arena that we know locally has a lot of work to be had. Right. And, um, so I think we just were really putting it out there and people were starting to kind of notice cause Red Bull is locally in this area, but then things like my friend who started coming to, I met at our creative meetup that we started here. He works at ASICS. I did a logo for his wife's ice cream company. He loved it. Then they're like, Hey, ASICS needs a logo for this small you know, event, we need to, uh, a brand for this event. You know, it's, it's literally like taking on the job that you think, ah, this may not be huge, but it'll be fun. Everybody knows somebody a little bit higher up or with a little bit more clout than them. Right. <laughs> so I think it's just really taking care of the people in your life and trying to put yourself out there to meet people, which I know has been hard in the last few years, but even just going to like live things like Adobe live and they have the live chat jumping in there and saying hi to people, starting conversations, finding them on Instagram and Twitter and following up with them. Some of our greatest leads have been through friends we literally only know on the internet. We've never even met in real life. Oh, yeah. Well, and the power of cold emails, because like this agency reached out to us, a smaller, like more like a studio, even they call it themselves an agency. They, they reached out and said, if you ever need subcontractor help, like we're around and they did incredible work, but we don't usually subcontract that often. However, we get a lot of work in that I can't, we can't take on. I refer to them all the time because they cold emailed me to work for us, but I, it, that didn't work out, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like if you have a good portfolio and you're willing to put yourself out there, it's amazing what it's, can come back. You just have to kind of like, it's a numbers game. It is a numbers game. It, it really is. But another interesting thing about what you were saying, there are agent, there are, sorry, brands like Nike, Red Bull, who have so much work that they need done and so many sub projects and sub events like, and they're kind of, the budgets aren't always what you would think they would be, to be honest. And so if you can get in with some, those kind of companies and you're kind of an up and coming studio, they want that kind of like experimental, like really relevant look for a lot of their capsule collections, a lot of their events. So really, I mean, reach out to those places, never fear because art directors really, they're, they're on the hunt for what's new and relevant in those kinds of worlds. Okay. A couple of things to, to talk about here. Some of the things, and you're going to hear recurring themes here is you, you need to be a little bit fearless. You really do. And that's what you're saying. uh, Cause that leads you right into the whole, put yourself out there. Uh, Cause if you don't, no one will ever know. And Amy, I guess you're the, 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 the poster child for this. Cause you keep just saying, Hey, pay, Hey, you want to talk to me or not? And, and host, hosting events and doing things that creative people generally freak out over, like sending out emails to people they don't know and being visible in public and seen. 
And the other part of your secret is be in Southern California. Because it's <laughs> to be honest, that. right? It is. I, I can't, I have to admit, and I think this a lot, like there is a perk to being in an area where a lot of business goes down. We're right in the middle of, you know, Hollywood, LA, like huge you know, it's ports. There's, there's so much going on, not to mention yeah. San Francisco, which is just a plane right away. So right. there's definitely value to that. But if you give yourself a budget for conferences, you can meet just as many cool people if you're just putting yourself out there and just, you know, making the time. And there's people in your area that do cool things and you just never know who they know or who's in their circle of influence. So it's like, take advantage of what you can in your area. And then that, that will start to grow if you just do right by your clients. But, um, cause yeah. I mean, the things that have come that have had nothing to do actually with local connection, Interestingly, so Red Bull was in the DM. They were just searching hashtags, the power of like literally just hashtagging your work and art directors are looking for a certain kind of thing that they need to you know get approved to do for their kind of thing that. But also we reached out to a lot of people who worked at brands that we really admired on Twitter. And we met a ton of really cool people that way who, you know, that wasn't through a local connection or a local meetup. That was just the power of the Internet, you know. <laughs> and so there and we work remote. We don't have a kind of like an office where people can come to and we can like woo them and wine them and dine them. So we did kind of have to take advantage of that like remote reach out kind of approach that people in, you know, secondary third markets, so that kind of thing have to do a little bit more of, but it's possible. It totally is possible. Yeah. I'm glad you say that, but I also was saying it in a, in a very serious way because I have a lot of friends that are not from California and they're like, Chris, the kind of budgets you're talking about, just not, I'm like, well, dude, this is kind of just normal here. And yeah, we pay yeah this living tax quote unquote to be yeah. here because real estate prices are ridiculous. And like, you, you know, we were talking, we we're joking beforehand, like you can get a tiny little place and it's going to cost you an arm and a leg to get. But there's this thing where if there's a lot of enterprise and commerce and entrepreneurs, the, everybody's <laughs> looking to, to grow their company. And if you're in the creative service space, you're ideally situated. Like you said, there's a lot of people in your backyard, right? In Newport or in Orange County, tons of businesses from retail, fashion. We're in LA, it's entertainment capital of the world. Lots of opportunities, you pay for that. And we need to be around that. But you said too, don't let that be your limiting thing because opportunities exist. You just have to travel a little bit. You can go to a conference, you can go to a trade show or something and just be around others who yeah. are looking for help right now. And the other thing that you said, you're like, um, Chris, there's this thing, it's called social media. You do it, you <laughs> might get some opportunities and it's totally true. It is, and it's true. And it's saturated now. I mean, Chris, how do you feel? Like, I almost feel bad because it's like, we got in early. We got in when it was like, there was room to be had. Now it is, I feel like it is hard to stand out now. I, I totally understand. But at the same time, there's a cyclical nature to popularity, right? That's true. And, yeah. and I'm saying that in a good way. Like the brands are the people that have the big followings now. Like it's sad, but familiarity breeds contempt, as they say. <laughs> and I think there is something like there is a different kind of advantage to being the new person on the block who has that fresh voice. And I think there are there's a hunger for that. And there is a benefit to being like kind of the the up and comer. So don't worry if you're not the 60,000 or 200,000 follower person, because to be honest, like they start to get to a point where they've actually they're priced out of a lot of people's like budget. And there there could be a point where even like there's overexposure, but that's a whole other thing. All to say like every single kind of person deals with their own kind of yeah. problems. Right. And, um, right. you know, I don't know. We had, I mean, we, we were up and coming like for plenty of time and, and we, I think we did have a, an advantage of being like, Hey, we do really quality work as quality as any one of these really well-known people, but you're, you're going to pay studio prices, not, you know, top built prices, you know, and we kind of played that angle for a while. And you mean in a few short years, you guys will be grandmas. And so somebody will be looking to fresh new <laughs> hotness, right? Is that what you're saying? Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> There's always room. I think there is. No matter how saturated something is, there's always room for people who do it better. Mm -hmm. That's and a good point. So there's usually the rush and the the people who are early in get first first mover uh, advantage, but eventually the market settles and then just the cream rises to the top. So just be on top of your game. Have a personality, have an angle. Like that's what I love about like you had Adam JK on. He would not claim to be a great drawer. Like he would not say like, like I can draw a figure from memory. Like that's his charm. That's his charm is he's not trying to be the most perfect drawer. Like that's why he's awesome. And his voice is so funny. So it's like, you don't have to be the best even like you just have to have 
like a funny, interesting story, like in something doesn't even have to be funny, just interesting, like a different angle. Well, it's like there's so many of those of like cartoon shows, like the, when The Simpsons came on, everyone was kind of like, wow, a, a cartoon show for an ad- adults, you know, like how novel. And now it's like you wouldn't think there'd be any more room for cartoon <laughs> shows for adults. And yet they keep coming up with more. It's just like if you can do it in a new way, there's room for more stance socks. Like who thought we need another so- sock brand? But they came in and did it different. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's just the power of like positioning in a way that people haven't seen from something they're very familiar with. Right. Right. I think that's also the power of recognizing niche markets and saying just because there's sock companies doesn't mean there's a sock company for me, for dog lovers, for people who like Argyle or for people who are like dressed as lumberjacks today. I mean, you could do different kinds of things and there's a market out there. Um, I wanted to ask you this question because I'm like, oh my God, we're running out of time here. What is your relationship with money today? I know this about people who grow up not on the coast. Uh, They believe in hard work. There's always a a sense of guilt when it comes to getting paid. (laughs) Uh, You you cut your teeth and develop some bad habits at this company where it's just like, just say yes to everything. What is your, your own evaluation of what's your relationship with money today? I actually think I'm really proud of what we're getting. Like I think we've done some projects that have really kind of put our, that sounds, this is going to sound really vain. And I don't mean it to, it's just like when you work for 10 years to grow your brand and you want to get the projects that Mackie Saturday gets that, you know, um, Jessica Hish gets those kinds, that level of project to finally get some, it feels so good. Cause like <laughs> we got this SeatGeek logo, which is, I think that's to date, probably one of our biggest logo projects for like a brand that's like known, a pretty, a fairly known brand, you know? And so after that, we've gotten a few other inquiries that are of the same kind of level and caliber. And we've been able to land prices that I never would have thought we could do just because we, we didn't get an MBA and we weren't like, and we're only a four person studio. Yeah. And we're a small studio, but I am so grateful for people who, when we were coming up, we went to Epic Currents like in what, 2016, which was this kind of like a designer event thrown by Dan Petty and Mackie Saturday was there. And I was asking him like, I don't even understand how anyone could charge 10 grand for a logo. And this was back then, you know, and he was like, you can, like, I'm telling you right now, you can, your work's good enough. You just have to work up to it and you have to get your decks right. You have to get your presentation right. All I can say is you've got to get the presentation right. Cause people who pay that much, it's all about, they just, they need a certain level, you know? So just having people along your journey who are just telling you, no, you can, it's, it, it's not impossible. And then from there, like slowly getting that price and getting that rate and then like boosting our confidence to do that as a new kind of median and then raising the rate even more. Like, I don't know. It's just, um, I do feel like we're finally more confident that we can scale to those higher, higher budget projects. But at the same time, we still love doing, uh, projects for mom and pops as well, mixing it in because there's a level of freedom and like, just like joy on return on investment when you help like a friend who's starting their pasta shop or, or things like that. And so being able to mix that has been really rewarding to us and is the perfect blend. And we're still making, you know, a, a good amount of money and we are putting away savings and that kind of thing. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, can I ask you a money question? Sure. <laughs> I'm scared. Ah. And you should be. You should be because one of our most popular videos is when I tell people how much we charge for a logo and they freak out over this stuff. Like nobody gets paid $18,000 and they're really quick to say, oh, I'll just go to Fiverr. Oh, Chris, you've developed a whole career and to saying no and not getting any clients, right? Okay. I, I, I'm going to ask you the question. What do you charge for a logo? Generally speaking. We do it in tiers. So we have three tiers and they're basically three base prices that we do plus or minus. So it's like small company, which is mom and pop people that we love, or we just really believe in what they're doing. Could be friends. Medium is, you know, the the mid-sized company, like they could do big things later, but they don't have the budget now, you know, that kind of thing. Or maybe they have a decent amount of funding. They're not using personal money. There's some sort of a built-in like budget, budget there. Yes. And then there's the big client, the people who have the big name who are courting the bigger agencies, but maybe I find that a lot of people these days are feeling jaded with bigger agencies. Uh, there, I, I found that there's a, so much open mindedness towards using small firms, you know, where you just get an expert on the team. So, um, those would be like the higher rates and we don't get as many of those. Of course, I would say for that kind of level of logo, we've done what would like you say? One a quarter. 
Really? You want no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, no, because I do the quoting. Well, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, we've maybe done th- maybe we do three, two or three in a year. Yeah. The high, high one, and then yeah. mostly the middle size, and then peppered in with a few of just like friends or things that we're so passionate about that are small business. But I mean, to be honest, like like you were saying, some some locations just can't afford the same rates, right? So it's like um, we'll do it for as low as. I mean, a thousand dollars and then we'll go all the way up to 50 to 60. Was that uncomfortable for you to say? No, I was like, the silence silence (laughs) was was like a piano dropping on Wiley Coyote. Like I (laughs) heard it coming. No, but it is. That being said though, the 50 to 60, when you are a small studio, boots are on the ground. I mean, the work that's put in to ensure that usually the, the use cases there are so broad. So you have to prove that this thing will work across so many different applications. Because usually that at that level, it's for an established brand. Yes. And they're taking on a lot of risks to put this new thing out in the world. So yeah. you really have to prove it to Stress them. Stress test it. Yeah. So there's a lot more of the soft skills of the presentations. And of, sometimes hiring subcontractors if we need help mm-hmm. just in ideation phase or putting together decks, things like that. Well, so. purely the time of just getting the board and all the people, all the stakeholders that are involved to agree. agree, right? Yeah. So, th- I mean, that's why the price goes up, you know, but, um, yeah. but you know, what's so interesting, there's so much to be learned about pricing and money from movies. Like I was watching my fair lady the other day <laughs> and, you know, this professor of linguistics, this like street urchin comes in and is like, I'll pay you. Like, I forget what it was like five pence to teach me to talk right. And he's, and uh, the guy in the room's like, that's nothing. That's like a slap in the face. And then the guy's like, actually, that's all the money she has. If you think about it, it's a fortune (laughs) for her. It's the best money I've ever made. And that's the whole thing about a sliding scale of value for pricing on things where it makes sense, obviously, where it's not just like a service that anyone can do, where it's like, you know, a specialized service. So, um, and you do, you slide it on scale based on what they can. Or that's what we do. Or that's what we do. Yeah. They can value and, and it's worth it, the value to you and the value to them. Okay. I asked this question because obviously it's a very tricky thing. Most creatives don't want to talk about money. The fact that you and I and you together talk about money and teach people on how to run a business, eventually we got to talk about money somewhere. And so people are gobsmacked that they're like, what can a human being do do uh, with their hands that can warrant such high price tags, right? But I think you explained it. There's a lot of different things that are going on. And people are going to have a reaction to this when they hear this episode, for sure. They're going to, and that's why we are a little reluctant to say these things because it feels fine to me, but I also don't want people coming out of the woodwork trying to say, well, who do you think you are? Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, uh, Amy's finally like realized her dream. <laughs> the world's most famous designer <laughs> can charge. <laughs> oh, hardly. Oh, hardly. You know what I mean? That's so funny. It's like, I'll design you a logo and you can buy me a BMW. It'll yeah. work just, it's a fair trade, right? And people are like, no. And it's because they have a false, um, false yeah, attachment to labor and value. This gets into like Karl Marx, labor theory, value and all that kind of stuff that historically speaking in the predominant way to measure value is through labor. Hmm. And so people who know how to design logos, like that is not worth the amount of labor that goes into like a a five series BMW or something. And they can't process that. Sure. I'd love for you to just take a minute and think, what can you say to the people who are going to have this horrible reaction to hearing both of you say, well, we've charged as much as 50 K before. This is your opportunity to talk straight to them, to their heart and their soul right now. Well, it's interesting. Once you hit a certain level, um, you'll be laughed out of the room if you don't quote a certain amount. If you say it's only worth a thousand, I can do this for a thousand dollars. They don't want you to do it for a thousand dollars. At that level, there's an amount of prestige that's wanted as well as they want to know that you have your skin in the game a bit. If you only do it for a thousand dollars, you might not have the dedication level of, okay, they're going to pay me $50,000. $50,000. This, I want, I want to make sure I have everybody on the team that we need to make this the best project that they've ever had. Right. So it's like, there's, like you said, it's, it's more of a, a mental thing. And it's the reason that, you know, LeBron wants to go out and buy a Louis Vuitton, you know, 
bag, bag. <laughs> yeah, fanny pack or whatever bag instead of go to Costco and get one for five dollars. Kirkland. Kirkland brand, baby. Right. <laughs> Kirkland. Actually, I saw Jamie Lee Fox the other day on TikTok with his daughter and he got his jeans from, it was something like $20 jeans and it was making me laugh so hard. It wasn't Kirkland, but it was something similar. Anyway, so some people still are level-headed, but but when you get to that level, you want the prestige of saying, like, we got this designer, we got this studio, and and it builds in the value, you know, of when you launch this rebrand, you know? And um, so I think maybe when we were like five years in, again, speaking with people like Mackie, they were saying, like, you have to start positioning yourself to be perceived as that higher echelon. You need to put the money into the website to make that look like it's not just a glorified WordPress. You need to do all these things to show that you belong in the among the lineup on Rodeo Drive. Not, not that specifically, but you know what I'm saying? Um, so that people feel like they're going to the top brand studios when they come to you. Yeah, this is a lot about perception. Perception yeah. is reality. So the reason why the food tastes better is because the ambiance of the restaurant and the way you're spoken to and the, the tablecloth and the, the cloth napkins, it all creates an experience for you. Seth Godin writes about this in his book, All Marketers Are Liars, in that we're complicit in the lie. So we think the steak is better because we've seen that <laughs> chef on TV. I've, mm -hmm. I purchased your cookbook, so I know. And so part of you building your brand is to create that experience for people in their mind because we're emotional buyers and we lie to ourselves all the time, right? So is true. that Louis Vuitton fanny pack better than the Kirkland model? <laughs> <laughs> it's debatable. They but both it makes you feel very different. Volume. It does. They, they both make you feel like you're from a different fashion era. <laughs> you know, they both achieve that equally, but it feels different. And, you're saying and even too, for like, the way that your client is perceived, right? It's like, they don't want to say they only spent a thousand dollars on this logo. They want to say, we went, went to the top agency and that builds in respect from the end user too. Oh, they got so-and-so to do it potentially. You know what I mean? Like it all kind of builds on itself to, yeah. The thing that you said, and I, I want to emphasize for people to hear this is that when Red Bull is calling you or Nike or Asics or whoever, and they're looking to help, help, help get help launching something that's going to generate a quarter of a billion dollars of revenue for them this year. And you quote them some ridiculously low price relative to what they're expecting to pay. What they're going to feel is a sense of you're new. Uh, you have a small team, you're a fly by night operation and I'm losing something here. And they right. want to buy assurance, not insurance, yep. but assurance mm -hmm. that you've been doing this and there's a team and there's a whole process and they're paying to feel better that the proper amount of attention and time is going to be spent on something. Otherwise they can't consider you. You yeah. can lose a job because you're too cheap. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. it's hard for people to hear, but it's true. <laughs> but right? there's also the opposite side of the coin and it depends on the service they're coming to you for. And yeah. obviously what the project is, but we've definitely had the bigger brands come to us earlier in our career when they knew we, they, we were a small studio and they were hoping f to get the, the bottom bin prices because it was a smaller thing or a little event. But some brands really throw their notoriety around and expect yes. some really crazy prices. I mean, crazy low prices. Like even right. for our standards, when we were <laughs> three years in, we were like, excuse me, I get more from my friend who lives down the street and runs a donut shop. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so it's like, there is both sides of it, which is interesting, yeah. you know, and um, and it's funny once you know the certain companies, because then when you see all the people working for them, you're like, ah, <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So they said yes. Not like right. you should feel bad about it, but you <laughs> realize that there are certain projects with certain brands that look really great yes. to other yeah. clients that maybe don't pay very well, actually, yeah. but it doesn't matter. Like it adds a credibility to get the sure. medium sized clients who want to think I worked with a brand who worked with Nike. Yes. And actually <laughs> Nike jobs are kind of like, like, um, you can, like there's a lot of jobs to be had at different tiers, which is great. It, they're a great company to work with. They have a great brand. They have a really great creative like vibe. So it's like, if you can get those smaller jobs, even though that, you know, and I'm not saying they pay really poorly. They're not one of the ones that I'm talking about, but I'm saying like they have little events and capsule collections that 
it's you know, a smaller impact. It's a small, It'll only be yeah. sold at one event in one city. Right. It's, it's just a shorter lifespan. It's a shorter lifespan. So it's not going to be like the big like rebrand budget. And so you do have to kind of like temper your expectations. But I mean, we're so grateful for those little capsule projects and event projects with Red Bull, which, you know, were really great portfolio pieces and did give us that notoriety of having worked with a big brand. And for sure, that was like a big part of us building um, our name, I think. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. Do you think that there's a ceiling to what you think is reasonable for someone to pay you to design a logo? Yes. I do. I do. <laughs> do. I, I do. It is crazy. Sometimes I'll hear Wait, who's things. Who's this speaking? Hold on. Isn't this, this is Amy. Uh, this God's is gift Amy. to design? Shoot, shoot for the stars, Amy. <laughs> shoot for At the stars. At some point, it just feels like gross and gratuitous. And shoot some cars. <laughs> I mean. you know? Okay. Hold on. Hold the presses. Hold on. Amy, We're still the from one, Kentucky. We can't help it. <laughs> yeah, they're it's still, you, know, you take the girl out of Kentucky, right? Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. So what is the ceiling for you, Amy? To be honest, I don't know. I think it's a feeling. I think you know kind of when you get there. I think here's what I think. I don't know if it's a specific number. I just know there's an attitude that can come along with getting used to getting the higher rates. And you almost become like this endless hunger of like, I need more. I need a higher rate. I need a higher rate. Let's see if I can get more. And I think that's just can be an empty and just kind of meaningless chase if you're just after how much can I get. And at some point, your service in the client's mind won't return on that investment to them and they'll start to feel more jaded. I once had a client who told me and he owns like some of the most awesome restaurants in Southern California. One of them is the cannery. And he always, he said, I always like to have a kind of like mediocre facade. And I was like, what? And he said, I want them to see kind of like a, okay, building. But then when they get inside, I want them to be absolutely wowed. And I think it's just that old adage of oh, under pro- or over promise or no, under promise, over deliver. <laughs> that old wow. adage. Wow. <laughs> that old adage that you can't get right. <laughs> fool me once, fool me twice. You can't fool Shame me all the time. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. You, you know the one. You know what I'm trying to uh, Try and give advice and to just. <laughs> but, but truly though, right? It's like, it's, you, I just always want to make sure that the clients that come to Hoodspot, no matter what they pay, feel like they got an amazing outcome for what they paid. I want them to feel great about what we did together. And I think at a certain point, if they just feel like you're sucking them dry and it's all about the money, they'll sense that, you know, even if it is a top brand that can't afford it, yeah. like not saying that they should get some sort of a cut rate, but as long as it's fair for both sides and it's not just getting to a point where it becomes a bubble and it's just going to ruin it for everyone, you know, <laughs> like, cause I mean, hmm. I don't tulip know. bubble, okay. is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, at some point we just become tulip bulbs. <laughs> Chris Rainison, the words are starting to fail us now. <laughs> this is right, gone off rails. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to stay here for a minute. So you were talking about when the restaurant owner says, I-, "I want a mediocre facade because I want to temper expectations," and so they're completely blown away once they walk inside. You're drawing that parallel to if you charge so much money, the expectations that you have to live up to are probably more than what you want to deal with. And then there's certain words that you use that I want to just, I'm I'm not a fan of here. Here we go. All right. (laughs) When you say like, well, it's a chase. And if you, if you pursue it, like I need to make this amount of money, otherwise I'm not going to be happy. And it's an endless, probably you didn't use the word hollow pursuit, but you said it makes you feel like you're sucking them dry. When I think of sucking people dry, I think of vampires, leeches, and parasites. Is that the feeling you have about certain price points that you become that kind of person? I don't think it's the price point. Again, I I don't think it's, I don't, I think it's different for every individual because I actually am very practical and Jen and I actually do set a number every year. That's a goal that we want to make. And it's always more than the previous year. And so far we've always met that goal, which has been amazing. But, um, so I actually do really believe in making monetary goals for yourself. I think it's a really great way to know if you're growing and, you know, just to make sure you get what you need to run the business successfully. But that being said, when your whole, it's easy to get wrapped up in, especially when you hear famous designers talk about like, oh, I get this much, I get this much. It's really easy to get wrapped up in, well, I could get this much. And starting to have that become your reason, reason to be and reason to do. And I just think that's can be a really slippery slope um, from getting away from I just I this is gonna sound so Kentucky, but just doing quality work for real for good rates for everybody. I still want to make more next year than I did this year. So, but just not having it be the whole reason. 
Yeah, it almost sounds like uh, the LL Bean catalog I got the other day, which is make a high quality product and charge a fair price. It's <laughs> you, you guys with that whole like, you know, oh, just a modest shit. amount of profit. My whole thing is uh, make a quality product and get as much as you can. It's a yeah. little different no, philosophy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could be more like that. <laughs> no, but uh, well, here's the other the thing that I hate about myself though is when I'm like, well, it's also a good learning experience though. You know yeah. when you quote something and they say yes too fast and you're like, damn it, I could have quoted it higher. And then you like resent everybody. Yeah. And it's like, yes. you know, I don't want to go into a project resenting someone thinking that like I, I didn't get enough and they got, they got the wool over my, <laughs> like, so I'm you trying to, you yeah, as, as, as soon as it's, a, <laughs> as soon as it's approved, I just want to yeah. start thinking positively about like, okay, I'm going to make this killer and I'm grateful that I got it. Yeah. Now, of course I probably, I always take note of what did they say yes to and did they say yes to fast? Cause I want to make note of that for the next time I talk to someone with the same industry, same kind of background. Cause then on, that's how, you know, that's how you fine tune your, your quoting. Sure. So it's not like you said, should be yeah. just like blindly ignorant about it. But at the same time, I don't want to be someone who's just like kind of always like grumbling and like, you know, <laughs> about how much I wish I would have gotten from right, someone, you know? Right. So I guess so, it's more of an attitude thing. It's like, you just got to keep your yeah. attitude grounded. Okay. This is where it's hard to uh, read someone's attitude or intention or motivation, right? We, uh, we can only just have general conversations about what we can see when it's done. 100%. Now, Amy answered the question really quickly. Like there is. Jen, are you in alignment? Is there a ceiling? Um, <laughs> I mean, yes. Wait, wait, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Your, your name is what you <laughs> Back up, Amy. Hold on, back, back up, up, back up, back up. Give her a moment. Let there um, be silence. Go ahead. It is funny though. Well, the minute you make the most, I, this isn't an answer. This is just, I'm just going to, it's an observation. The minute you make the most, you become the biggest target, right? The so, Jeff Bezos is. <laughs> and I, I think you can easily just become, like, that's how you can just kind of, edge yourself out, even out of your industry almost. So, and I'm not saying that this is an example of it, but it's just something that came to mind. So pentagram is like a very easy target or these top, top, um, you know, agencies because they put out these rebrands and if people don't like it, it's easy to say, oh, everything's like turned to shit. Like, why are they getting those rates? You know, and not to say you have to do everything to please everybody else. Cause that would be like an exhausting task and no one should live their life that way. But, um, I don't know. It's just like when you're charging so much, it's easy for people, I think, to think, well, is it even worth? I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm just like, it's like Jeff Bezos, like everybody who makes the most money becomes the enemy. I don't want to be the enemy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, Those are called first world problems, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. I make so Maybe much too... money that everybody hates me. Like shut oh the front God. door. You, you Deal become with so it. detached from normal, uh, the normal human existence that you have to move to space. You know? like, <laughs> like, I don't want to have to go into rocketry. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I, I want to share something and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll hopefully find a way to like finalize our thoughts on this, which is what my business coach Kira told me many, many years ago. I said, Kira, this isn't normal. And he like looked at me, he goes, normal. You, you do understand uh, California is not normal relative to the rest of the United States. And then Southern California is not normal to all of California. And then LA is not Southern California. And then Santa Monica. So he's like, you are so far from normal right now. You need to just understand that. Because if we were to travel back in time to to coffee shop, Amy and Jen, and said, you know, you're going to charge $50,000 for a logo, something that you're going to be able to do in a couple of days. And you would probably then say, shut up. That's so ridiculous. Nobody would be worth that much. But your perspective changes as you continue to grow. We're on board. Same, same thing. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So some young person in the middle of this country who's never made $2,000 on anything is sitting there thinking, there's no freaking way that these ladies are worth that amount of money. So it's all relative, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you one more time. Is there a ceiling on how much you can charge for a logo? No. <laughs> <laughs> Jen is so easily persuaded. Did no, I pass? Jen just wait. This is perfect, Did by the I way. It's hypnosis through uh, through Jen Zencaster here. Wow. You're like, I'm done. Um, <laughs> no, I, I only want you to answer dream? that the way that you feel because I'm pretty sure when you're actually grandma age, like legitimately, 
you and I will be sitting here. We'll do another conversation. So what's the most you ever charge for a logo? And you're like 407,000. I'm like, uh-huh. That's what I thought. <laughs> and you're like, well, but 600 is ridiculous, Chris. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's all relative because the bar moves, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I like what you're saying. I like the vision yes. you see for my future. <laughs> yes. I'll help you. <laughs> you know, okay. So the, the idea here is this, and I, I will hopefully will plant a little seed and see where, where it grows to. You guys watch Million Dollar Listing LA just mm-hmm. to see how crazy home prices are? No, oh, but I look on Zillow every day. <laughs> yeah, same here. It's like, mm-hmm. oh my Love God, it. that's crazy, right? It's therapy. And the, the realtors, they play a game. Now you could say some people are a little sleazy or slimy, but they play the game and they're entrepreneurs. They're salespeople. Uh, they want to set new benchmarks. Like I sold the most expensive single family residence in Beverly Hills or I broke new records. And I think there's something really cool and inspirational about that that they're business people through and through. And that's what they're trying to do. So I don't tell myself, oh, I need to charge this amount of money or I think I'm worth it. The only thing I ask myself is, I wonder how much. I wonder how much they'd be willing to pay. And it's okay if they say no, I'm not offended. And I'm pleasantly shocked and surprised that they keep saying yes. And you had said this, if your clients keep saying yes, it's a signal that maybe you are actually worth more than you think. And then you should try a new number because we want them to push back a little bit. We want some resistance to know that we did actually meet them at their ceiling and they're giving us what they were prepared to spend. Not that we're extorting them. There's nothing unethical about this, but that you are not leaving money on the table, which they were happy to pay you. Right. Yeah. Oh, I agree with that. Yes. hundred percent. We have not designed a lot of logos in our lives, in our life, but we've been able to charge a lot of money and, That's the thing I want to help creatives understand. Mm -hmm. The value isn't in what you see it is. It's what they see it is because Mm -hmm. they're prepared to spend different amount of money. So don't use your own value system to decide this is the way it's going to be. Sure. And that's probably the hardest thing is to learn how to do that kind of recon and pick up the context clues to figure out what your client's value system is. You know what I mean? And I know when we first started out, um, I couldn't talk money on the fly. I just wasn't confident enough and I didn't have those skills honed well enough to do it real time. So that's why we perfected our proposal deck because I would take all my notes on the call and then I would get off the call and say, okay, I'm going to send you a proposal you know, by tomorrow. And then I would do crazy recon and call as many friends as I could to get like good feelers and, and like ideas on like if my number sounded right. So that's um, how we did it back then. But I mean, Blair Enns, who you've had on your, your show a lot, he's a big proponent for talking money on the phone to save time. And that is the best way, 100%. But you do have to kind of like get yourself used to that skill. So we kind of did it slowly through that kind of like have the call, do the research and then send the proposal as a way to kind of um, work around that until we were felt confident to do that. But now I do find that that's like something I'm able to do better and better on the fly. And they have these little words that they say that I'm like, okay, that other client we quoted, you know, had that same thing. And I quoted him that and they didn't say yes, but you know, and I'm kind of running the numbers in my head and writing notes down as they're talking, but it's so true. Like you do have to kind of get used to business and be somewhat worldwide and in what these kind of companies make, what their income streams are like, you know, what kind of budgets they're usually working with, you know, that kind of thing, which is a whole other skill, probably, you know, it is a whole nother skill. And I'm, yeah. I'm glad that you're allies in the fight to help creative people learn how to be better business people, because we got to be able to take care of our business if we want to continue doing our art or design, right? Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I have a small challenge for you. And then I, I am just trying to mind time. We're, we're kind of running a little long. Thank you for your, for hanging in there with me. And then I have yeah. like one somewhat uh, not so serious question to ask you. Okay. Cool. All right. So here's the challenge. Challenge first is you had said something that every year you set yourself new financial goals and every year thus far, you've been able to hit that. So first of all, congratulations. Uh, that's progress. You guys are building and growing and you deserve every bit of success. Oh, thank you. My challenge to you is set goals that you know you can't hit mm. to set goals and deliberately fail. And I forget who said this. I want to say it's either Jim Rohn or Jack Canfield who said you need to set big, hairy, audacious goals. And it's not as important that you achieve those goals, 
but the person you become in the pursuit of those goals. Right. Totally. Oh, so I when you set these that. really high milestones for yourself, you're like, you know what? We have to write a third book and we have to go meet Oprah because that's on our thing. And what do we have to do to become a person that someone like that would talk to? Right. Yeah. And so I want to challenge you. For, so for 2022, I want you to be slightly disappointed that you didn't hit your goal. <laughs> okay. I love that. that okay? No, I cool. think that's great. No, that is great. I think that's great. We we do do like a safe goal and then we do like a dream big goal. Usually we've always yeah. met the safe goal. Sometimes we meet the dream big goal. So, but I'm okay. going to dream even bigger. Even bigger. One you've asked you're like, the right person to do this. <laughs> 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 right, right. She's already in outer space. So, you know, what's she's the as Amy. She's on Yeah, it. exactly. So what you want to do is to look at each other and like, there is no way in that we can do this. So then the means and the process, the hows will materialize or they won't, but that's okay. Yeah. And it's always nice to fail at a super big goal than actually to achieve a super small goal. Yeah. Yeah. Because usually My you opinion. still fail over what the safe goal would have been. Yes, that's huh? right. Uh, So that's a challenge. So in December of 2022, post pandemic, fingers crossed, we'll have a conversation. You'll DM me. It's like, Chris, you won't believe it. You won't believe it. You won't believe it. Put it on the test. We didn't hit our goal, but here's what we did. I need to hear. We we did not hit our goal, but this is what we did instead. And we're going to celebrate, right? Cool. I love that. Is that cool? I love that. so, So keep that down. Now. Okay. I didn't realize this, but this is my final question for you. I was like, how are you guys hearing me? And then I can see on on Jen, she has one half (laughs) (laughs) of an AirPod, right? Because I was like, how how can I hear? This is like, it must be really weird to only hear out of one side of your ear. But okay, you guys have mastered this game. So here's what I want to do. Here's the not so serious, serious question. I want you to look at each other. Okay. And I want you to say that the one thing you appreciate most about your partner, your sister, your partner in crime. What is the one thing that they bring to the table that you're like freaking a, if you weren't in my life, what a disaster this would be. Cause I want to see what you see in each other. If that's okay. Right. Oh, okay. I know it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wait, wait, wait. Before you say, before you say, are you both ready? Cause I don't want you to influence. Oh, yeah. I always have. You're ready. Yeah. Okay, okay, go ahead. No, sorry. We talk about it Amy, all the time. First. Yeah, because we have such different, even though we're very similar in our, in our tangible skills, our soft skills are very different. So without Jen, I would be making half of what I'm making. I have really big goals, but I just want to do them so badly that the money is neither here nor there for me (laughs) sometimes. So, um, I think I'd be getting half as much and Jen, as far as strategy goes, Jen is really good at gaining the trust of our clients. She's really good at speaking cohesively and really Honing in is what somebody took two hours to say into three really succinct goals or even one really succinct goal that can start guiding the project much easier. So um, Jen does the strategy that really allows us to work with these bigger clients. Oh, thanks, Sam. You're welcome. Okay, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would love it for you to say the number one thing I appreciate the most about Jen is. Okay. Okay. It's got to follow the format. Oh God. Yeah, it's got to follow the format here. <laughs> How do I put that? Not, no shotgun approach. Just like the number one thing that she brings to the table that I appreciate the most is. The number one thing that I appreciate about Jen is. Her business sense mind. Okay. I love that. That's very succinct. Yeah. Did you kick her under the table, by the way? <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. Dude, you better say it right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's flip, good. flip need... rolls. Mm-hmm. Okay. Amy, the thing that I appreciate. <laughs> it's like I don't like having to look at you. <laughs> Why is it so awkward? You guys can't look like at each other therapy. when you talk. It's too awkward. It's like yeah. yeah. I know she the didn't make I... eye contact with you. I know. She won't look at me. <laughs> so weird. The thing that I appreciate most about Amy is her. Um, it has to be succinct. Like optimism. You can take like out. I'm sorry. I'm a liker. her. Um, her optimism, because the kind of <laughs> the way you see things and how easy it'll be, which it <laughs> never is, but just like the way you're just like, you have an optimistic vision of like everything you want to do and you just go for it, which I guess that's like adventurous optimism. Huh? Oh, I love that. Thank you, Jen. 
which I, I like to dream and stuff. And then I, I just like write it in a notebook <laughs> and then put it in a drawer <laughs> and then pack that away and then yeah. Yeah, pack it away and forget it at a house that I sell right. 10 years later. And, uh. Yes. So if I were to, to guess, and I'm not into this woo woo stuff, but I would say like, um, Amy must be an air element. She's yeah. lofty. She's floating. She doesn't want to be tied down by these things, but she's oxygen for your business. And then Ooh. Jen, I say you are earth. You're grounded. Oh, that's you're it. pragmatic. You're practical. We got to get the stuff done. And you know what happens when air mixed with earth, right? You get a dust cloud. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was trying to make get, it like you get a move. Litter you get a move. That's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> if it was water and earth, I would say mud, but yeah. it didn't work. It did. Okay, I'm sorry. That's as far as I got with that. That's why Chris, I'm not that was so uh, eloquent. I mean, if I was paying you, I'd approve this right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's been a delight. Uh, it, I can't believe it's been an hour and a half. Thank you very much, uh, Hood Sisters, Hood Spa. Uh, uh, it, it's 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 so fun. I already know every time I talk to you, I'm gonna leave more energetic. Then I came in. So thank you very much. Oh, Chris, thanks for having, thanks for us. having us. You, I, I would tell this to everybody I know. You do so much for the design community and all your resources are like gold. So thank you for continuing to do what you do and to invite us into it. It's just fun to always yeah. hang out with you and the crew. Everything that you're the whole team does is, is just really, really awesome. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. Drinking I drinking the Kool-Aid. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if people want to find out more about what it is that you do, where should they go? They can find us pretty much everywhere at Hoodspa Design. So Instagram, Twitter, uh, and then we have a YouTube, which is just Hoodspa. And Hoodspa, is that how you spell it or is it a different it's, spelling? It's H O O D Z P A H. There you go. Hoodspa, because it's Amy and Jen Hood, and yep, they have Amy a lot of Hoodspa. So <laughs> I, I love it. It's very clever. And uh, the name. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you very much, ladies. 